Hey, good afternoon. I am Maya Ng from the Center for Livable Cities. I'm the MC for today's lecture. CLC was jointly established in 2008 by the Ministry of National Development and the Ministry of Environment and Water Resources to distill, create and share knowledge on livable and sustainable cities. The CLC Lecture Series is one of the platforms through which urban thought leaders share best practices and exchange ideas and experiences. Today, CLC will be launching our latest urban system study, the Land Framework of Singapore, Building a Sound Land Administration and Management System. For today's lecture, we are honoured to have with us Mr Tan Bung Kai, the Chief Executive of the Singapore Land Authority, SLA. Well, Mr Tan joined SLA as Chief Executive on the 1st of May 2015. While doing land administration business requires a good understanding of land laws, conveyancing, surveying and legal instruments such as leases and tenancies. One also needs to have a good grasp of real estate matters. Well, in this sense, well, although you know, Mr Tan actually said that he's an atypical public servant, but actually he is a very suitable candidate for this position. Well, Mr Tan is a lawyer by training and held several positions with the Singapore Legal Service including Justice Law Clerk and Assistant Registrar of the Supreme Court. Before he joined SLA, he was the Senior Vice President in the Group Procurement Office in Capital Land and Regional General Manager with the Escort Limited. Well, today, coming to almost his three years in SLA as the Commissioner of Lands, he's best placed to share with us the key roles of SLA, including how SLA works with different agencies, the principles and key challenges in the land administration and management system. Well, the format of today's lecture will start off with a presentation by Mr. Tan, and it will be followed by a moderated Q&A, and kindly hold all the questions till the Q&A session. So without further ado, let us put our hands together to welcome Mr. Tan Bunkai. Mr. Tan, please. Excellency, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, um, I hope you don't mind that I take a more informal approach to the presentation, uh, largely because um, I find myself uh, very uncomfortable standing at the rostrum, you know, not moving uh, for some time. Um, and if you can hear me clearly, I will be more than happy to answer any questions that uh, you may have. Um, I must confess that uh, as, a law, uh, as a young undergraduate studying law, um, Land law was not my favourite subject. Um, you will know why later. Uh, it is uh, an extremely tedious subject to study. Uh, in some ways, very archaic um, and uh, requiring a very precise eye for detail. Um, now, I have come to appreciate why this is so. Uh, more so in Singapore than many jurisdictions. Uh, but um, I would also hope to at least convince you that it is because of the robust structures that we have and the deep thinking that we have put in over the many years, especially those by the pioneer leaders, that today Singapore is what it is today because the back-end fundamentals, especially in land, are robust, are systematic and are very well thought through. Um, I will be more than happy, of course, to, you know, if you have any feedback on how things can be improved because we also realise that going forward, the world in the future will be quite different. And I think, uh, as I was uh, sharing with uh, uh, Excellency a little while ago from the Netherlands, there are many similar challenges. And I think it is through learning that we can try to constantly improve the as-built environment that we live in. So today, I want to give a snapshot of the role that we undertake in SLA, uh, not so much to replicate um, all the contents of what you will receive at the book launch, subsequently, but to just give you a flavour, as, as well as to tease out some, I think, of the more interesting, or to maybe some of you, the more contentious topics uh, that we face um, in our work. Singapore Land Authority was formed in 1st June 2001, so we are, in effect, 16, 17 years old. Um, it was formed through the amalgamation of four different departments uh, in the Ministry of Law. And I'll explain to you why you know, we are in the Ministry of Law and subsequently uh, not in the Ministry of National Development. I think we are often confused because in today's context, perhaps as a testament to how 
the public service works together, it is not ov obvious that certain statutory boards still reside with uh, certain ministries. Um, one of the oldest functions that we have is the survey department. Uh, King Peng, who is my chief surveyor, is here today. Survey is, I think, about 200 years uh, old today. As well as the land office, uh, you know, um, always to deal with the administration of land. We also have the uh, land titles registry, uh, a function that we inherited, a system that we inherited from the uh, British colonial days, which now serves as the fundamental of land title and property title ownership in Singapore. Um, if nothing else, today, if you are a homeowner in Singapore, you have a title, that title uh, is registered with the land authority and that forms your definitive uh, rights and obligations of a land or property owner. And of course, the land system support unit, because of the data that we collect, because a lot of the land-based information that we collect, which has now translated into a geospatial department, which I will more, be more than happy to share a little bit more later. So, how do we see our role? In the Singapore Land Authority, our vision is limited land, unlimited space. Very catchy, um, and to a large extent, um, very imaginative, if I may say. Limited land, anyone knows. Right, uh, Singapore today is only about 720 square kilometers, uh, but unlimited space. It is really how we unlock the value of land for anything and everything that is possible. Um, you may find that you know there's a bit of a little red dot, and um, it was deliberately made red, red uh, because it also, I suppose, uh, uh, says that we are small, uh, but that doesn't mean that we cannot grow in other ways. Um, our mission is really to optimise land resources for the economic and social development of Singapore. And today, the Singapore Land Authority is structured in three core areas. You have the developmental role, the regulatory role, and the geospatial role. And I'll talk a little bit about this um, later on. Our staff profile is about 500 plus. We are considered a medium-sized statutory board, and we reside uh, within the Ministry of, of Law. So, in terms of the land operations area, it will reside with the developmental role. In terms of the regulatory, typically the Land Titles Registry, and for the geospatial technology, which is something relatively new, okay, it will be on a separate uh, platform. One of the things that uh, you may be familiar with is uh, we produce a free app called OneMap. Uh, OneMap is, is based on all the data that we collect from landowners and land ownership. Um, incidentally, uh, for many young people, you know, you may or may not be familiar, but I assure you that today, if you are a parent of school-going children, that will be your most vital app because that is effectively the app which shows all the uh, properties within the one to two kilometer radius. Before I start about talking a little bit more about the Singapore Land Authority, I would also like to at least say that today, the ecosystem that we have is a result of the functions and the responsibilities that come together from the different public agencies. And really, if you look at it from its very broadest, it all starts with the concept plan that is produced by the Urban Redevelopment uh, Authority. Um, that is done every 10 years. It tries to extrapolate based on data, both uh, uh, you know, uh, um, present and future, to see and plan what the future of Singapore should be, uh, or would be. Um, so it really concerns about the strategic land use and transportation plan that will guide Singapore in the long term. Thereafter, obviously, you have the master plan, which is also produced by URA, which is reviewable every five years, which guides Singapore's development in the medium term. Zoning, planning parameters, and then all spelled out in this plan, so that in the nearer term, whether it's public agencies or the private sector developers will be able to rely on it and build. So you will see this constantly being refreshed because as time passes, sometimes circumstances change, it will also require a review of the plans. Thereafter, the different agencies in Singapore, and these are mostly private, uh, public uh, sector agencies, will come together and based on the long-term planning for Singapore, each of us will take up certain specific roles in order to build. So for example, in public housing, most of you would know that that role resides with the Housing Development Board. For industrial use, typically it's with the Jurong Town Corporation and so on. Right in the center, if I may put it perhaps a little bit simply, is the Singapore Land Authority. 
because then we serve as the gatekeeper where public agencies will liaise with us for land use and we will issue the titles and the leases for that use. Of course, back end, we will also make sure that a lot of these use conform to the rules and regulations protecting land use in Singapore. Um, if nothing else other than people, land is Singapore's only resource and I think it is important that we continue to use land judiciously as well as with prudence. So in terms of sort of like understanding our role, SLA plays the role in facilitating the development of Singapore through a robust land administration uh, framework. And I hope this sort of like sets the, the context of, of a lot of our work. Now then now I will explain briefly some of perhaps the areas of interest uh, because I think in the uh, book that will be launched, uh, we will describe in detail some many other areas which I would not have time to, to go through. Um, I thought that you know, I could possibly uh, touch a little bit on some of these key areas. Uh, quite contentious sometimes, uh, but hopefully over time, uh, we, I would like to share that there are also different ways that we have undertaken to try to mitigate some of the issues that have arisen. The first one is compulsory acquisition. The second is optimization of state assets, and the third one, obviously, is the geospatial and geodetic development in Singapore. Um, each, I will summarize with some of the challenges that we are faced today, um, and some of our thinking that how we can improve the processes going forward. So the first one, perhaps, is compulsory acquisition. Um, I used to have a standing joke with uh, many of my colleagues that you know when uh, people see the Singapore Land Authority offices knocking on their doors, it's really a purvey of bad news. Because the, the thing that you expect is that the government has come to acquire your land. So let me give you a little bit of our history of, of, of this. Um, since independence, I think um, you know, Singapore has been fairly well developed. Certainly when we became independent in 1965, uh, Singapore was already a bustling small country, struggling to find its own identity. Many of the businesses, many of the homes were centred around the central area. And I think the pioneer leaders believe that that was the time where we needed to replan the entire Singapore to have a more systematic structure of zoning certain areas as well, as well as to build in a more tidy manner. So in that sense, land acquisition came into being because it allowed the government to be able to secure large tract of land from the private community without excessive costs. Now obviously, if you read the literature in many of the public literature today, that is a very contentious issue. The last thing that many people uh, want or would accept is the fact that government comes in to take away your home, your private land, uh, without what many people perceive to be fair compensation. But really, the imperative then was to make sure that Singapore could continue to redevelop or to develop in a sustainable manner without bankrupting the country. Um, so like I said, it was necessary for the construction of new housing, industrial estates, and really comprehensive redevelopment of the entire central area. Of course, 50 years ago, if you had told them, well, in 20, you know, 50 years later, in 2010, 2015, Singapore would be what it is today, I think many of those then would not have believed you. But the reality is that the government, I believe, especially the pioneer generation, has been able to keep to its word and today, Singapore is largely very different from how it used to be uh, when we first became independent. Um, but, of course, land acquisition did not come on its own. When you do land acquisition, one of the big key fundamentals then was to make sure that we also had a structure where we could provide housing for those that have been dislocated. So in this hand, acquisition and resettlement went hand in hand. And really, once the land was acquired, when people had their homes taken away, when people had their businesses away, uh, you still needed to provide somewhere where they could continue their livelihood or their home. And that was really quite clear in the government's time, uh, mind at that point in time. So in that sense, uh, those affected were also given some priority for public housing that came through, and HDB at the time also offered uh, subsidised mortgage loans uh, uh, for those. So I think you know, if you read um, again, the book, some of this we'll go into to it in detail. So if you look at how Singapore has really transformed itself in the last 50 years, I mean, you know, you have heard and, and uh, in seen that obviously these are in the literature, in the public. Um, it is nothing short of a miracle. 
Uh, for the last 50 years, there have been many projects that have been undertaken by the government. Uh, first, you started with the 1960s, where you have the housing developments and the public housing projects. Today, the sev uh, 70s, you have the uh, construction of the Changi Airport. In the north and in the northwest, we also had to resettle some of the farms. In the 1980s, that was when we started to look at building the MRT, schools, and so on. Uh, in the 1990s, we continued with more infrastructure uh, development. And of course, in 2000, there's even more, uh, in today's context, more infrastructure, more transport uh, being carried through. So all in all, a lot of the acquisition that had taken place has now translated into the public projects that have uh, uh, been built. When we look at the land acquisition regime or the land acquisition scheme, which is contained in the Land Acquisition Act, there has also been changes. As Singapore matures, as Singapore becomes a more developed country, as Singapore perhaps becomes a country which is more economically uh, uh, affordable. Uh, one of the things that um, you would have noticed in the last time, before 2007, was that any acquisition, the compensation would have been based on the value of the land as at the date of a gazette or a historical statutory date. Right? And the statutory dates would have been in 1973, 1988, 1993, 1995, whichever is the lower. Right? This did not reflect the actual market value of the property or the site that was acquired. Now in 2007, a fundamental change was made by the government to now ensure that any acquisition would be compensated by market value as at the date of the Gazette. So that is actually a big shift in the way we have uh, uh, looked at compensation, but largely also because it was, it was also, I suppose, a recognition that the country would be able to afford that, as well as it being a much fairer or equitable uh, manner of compensation. Um, so over the times, as you can see from this time chart, there has also been changes to the Land Acquisition Act. The latest one being in 2015, where now amendments were made in order to allow the government to uh, acquire substratum titles, which means underground titles. We will continue to enhance the Land Acquisition Act, obviously to look at ways of how it can be improved uh, and how it can continue to serve the needs of the country as well as, as society. But more importantly, um, the manner in which we deal with land acquisition has also shifted. Um, not to say that in the past I think it has been done with a high-handed approach, but today we recognise more so than ever that land, property, houses are a very emotional issue. For many of us, it is where our memories are made. It is obviously also where uh, many children, our children may have grown up, you know, families come together and so on. Because it is an emotional issue, you have to try to then draw the balance between the redevelopment or the development uh, um, for the country and the ability to be able to take back or acquire the land at market value and how do you manage that process. So one of the things that we have now done is that as far as possible, for every acquisition that is done, we will walk the journey with the stakeholder involved. And this is no mean task because first and foremost, when emotions are high, the last thing you want or the last thing you expect is that they will welcome you with open arms. Okay. Um, and I think uh, sometimes, you know, I give credit to the officers, the junior officers especially, who will need to be very patient, you know, in dealing with this. Um, thankfully, I probably will, will say this, thankfully, I think uh, many uh, Singaporeans, uh, many members of the public are quite understanding. They understand that for the public purpose, in order to redevelop Singapore, in order to make better use of the land in Singapore, they are prepared to make that, I suppose, make that trade-off. Okay? But usually in the first, I suppose, couple of weeks, there is always that little bit of shock. Okay? There's always that little bit of surprise, which needs time. So we recognise that for us to do our job better, one of the things that we must do is we must walk the journey with them. Um, interestingly, and I, and I don't uh, uh, put this down, we now have more and more uh, stakeholders or owners who's properties have been uh, acquired, where we have walked the journey, where they come back and tell us, well, thank you for walking the journey with us. We appreciate the help. We may not, you know, have been so appreciative in the first place, uh, 
Um, but we really thank you for, for walking the journey with us. Now, of course, having said that, we will also try to do as much as we can back end, uh, including liaising with other agencies, uh, liaising with other parties, should there be the, the need arises. Um, this, I think, is quite fundamental because I think the entire public service in Singapore, we are also looking at how we can serve members of the public together. And this is, I think, the step that, that we have done uh, at the Singapore Land Authority. But looking forward, as I said earlier, what are some of the challenges that, that uh, we face? Um, one of them, if I put them very briefly, is market value. Um, we define market value and then when we assess market value, we will have valuers to do comparable you know, values and, and so on. Um, but to be fair, I think sometimes, not all the time, uh, there are indications that that is not the compensation that the other party is looking at. Okay? How do we balance this? Well, under the Land Acquisition Act, um, if you know, a party whose property, whose site has been acquired um, is, uh, uh, is, not, well, is, is not happy or, or does not accept the compensation amount, he or she has one right of appeal, which goes to the Land Appeals Tribunal Board uh, consisting of ind independent parties. Uh, we accept that right because we also believe that there should be an avenue uh, to, to not challenge the acquisition, but to review and relook at the compensation. Right? So that uh, uh, route of appeal is open to, to you know, parties who are affected by compulsory acquisition. But over and beyond that, before you reach the appeal stage, and then the lawyers will tell you, once you start fighting in court, everything breaks down. Um, is there a better way to, to, to manage? Is there a better way to value uh, um, you know, the property and so on? So that is one of the challenges that we constantly face. The second one, of course, is that in today's context, um, the land acquisition regime, to some people, is still viewed as a very draconian measure. I think if you look at many countries today, um, they do not have a similar legislative regime as Singapore, which allows the government to be able to acquire uh, the property. Uh, should there be other ways of, of doing it? Now, I, I should say this also, that in the Land Acquisition Act, uh, the reason for the acquisition is stated very clearly. It is for a public purpose. And I think over the last couple of years, you would also have seen that many of the acquisitions that are done is really done for the intended purpose of either building public infrastructure or trying to redevelop the area. So in recent, uh, the most recent big large-scale ones uh, that we have done are the acquisition of the two golf clubs uh, to build the high-speed rail uh, to, to Malaysia, as well as the comprehensive redevelopment of the entire Jurong Lake area. Now, if you see it in that context, perhaps as a bystander, you know, not affected by, by the acquisition, that may seem very logical. But how do you then square off with those people who are affected? Well, perhaps for the case of golf courses, well, nobody stays there. It is only a club. Um, but sometimes we may also need to, to uh, impact those who are live, uh, staying there. So how do you draw this balance? Having a regime which can still be considered fairly draconian versus a public purpose which is actually for the greater good of the country. Um, and I think this is where we look at, you know, the tension, you know, or the difficulties between uh, the citizen as oneself and the larger development of, of the nation. Um, and it's a challenge that I think all of us uh, uh, struggle today. Um, deep down inside, I think what we are trying to do is to look at Singapore's long-term plan to ensure that Singapore continues to have relevance, not only just 10, 20 years down the road, but 50, 100 years down the road. And in order to do that, there needs to be certain areas that the government may need to have some flexibility to move. The Singapore Land Acquisition, uh, the Land Acquisition Act is one of those that, that uh, uh, you know, is at least um, enshrined in legislation. But in order for us to carry that out properly, we also have to be mindful that we take due regard for the concerns as well as the needs of those who are affected. The second one, um, which I will talk about, is the optimization of, of state assets. Um, Singapore today um, has many old properties. Uh, some reside within uh, private hands, some are within the public. Um, in the past, uh, you know, we have, many, we have had many, for example, black and white bungalows that you will see around the country. Those come under the purview of the Singapore Land Authority. Uh, where possible, we will try to optimize um, 
you know, the use either by leasing them out or by putting them to different users. But more importantly, one of the things that we have done recently is that we have now tried as far as possible to open up as many of the vacant lands, right? Lands which are bare lands, which are not being built for the moment for members of the public to enjoy. And we will put up a sign there to say, well, please, you know, come and enjoy. The children can play football, uh, um, play games, play sports, and, and so on. Um, this is also a marked change from, I think, uh, quite a number of years ago where if it's state land, you're not allowed to come in, right? So going forward, uh, we do intend as far as possible to open up as many of these plots of land as possible. Uh, to date, I think we have made more than uh, open available more than two, 200 plots of land. Uh, even sometimes, you know, lands that you consider a little bit, uh, um, I should say, out of the norm, land under viaducts, you know, because we have quite a lot of expressway, you will find that, you know, sometimes the land under the expressways, um, we have tried as part uh, far as possible to perhaps put in some infrastructure, uh, work also with the various uh, uh, different parties so that they can be put to better use. And really, at the end of the day, this is really for the enjoyment uh, uh, and use by the public. For those that have a more specific use, for those that have properties uh, uh, bought, for example, perhaps uh, vacated buildings that have been returned by other ministries or statutory boards, we have tried to look at short or medium-term users provided they are not impacted by long-term development plans. So, for example, in certain areas, um, one thing that, that may, many of you will be familiar is uh, the Dempsey uh, area, Tangling Village. It used to be the old uh, army barracks. Um, it has been returned to the state, and it has turned itself, or you know, we have let it out for a mix of different users, including food and beverage, retail, and it has now, uh, I suppose, um, built an identity of its own. Our long-term objective, provided there are no plans for the site, is to make sure that members of the public can still go and use those facilities in whatever form, and hopefully also to be able to maintain and keep those properties for the longer term. So, because you never know, you know when some of these might be taken uh, uh, for redevelopment, but in the meantime, especially to keep them well for the next generation or for many generations to come. So we will try to put, as far as possible, many of these properties out for interim use um, to support social and economic uh, developments. Um, others that you will have noticed, for example, will be maybe uh, childcare facilities, in, sometimes in, in state properties, in black and white bungalows, uh, uh, and so on. Um, and um, we will, of course, look at new creative users. Um, for example, I think uh, Dempsey, like I said, is, is one of them. Uh, the other one, more commonly you will know, is a turf city. It used to be the old uh, turf club, which has now been converted into a whole host of different users. Uh, you have, on the one hand, where the open fields are, you have many of the uh, futsal or sports activities taking place. In the main block itself, you have uh, a mixture of, of not only F&B, but also other users. Um, more and more, we are also finding and, uh, and this is something that we are constantly looking into, into how many of these properties can be put for social and community users. So land under viaducts was one of them uh, that I've mentioned. Uh, sometimes, interestingly, we find that because the building has a historical angle to it, uh, there are more and more historical bluff, buffs, you know, who sort of like want to visit uh, these places. And there are tours being organized, uh, um, you know, to bring people around to explain to them the history. So this is the old Changi Hospital, right? Um, for those of you who know, there are many stories about the old Changi Hospital. But believe me, every time there's a tour that comes up, it's fully booked out within minutes. So this is one of them. The other one, of course, uh, uh, which you have seen, which is closed now for, for you know, restoration, is the old Tanjong Paga Railway Station. Uh, this is the inside and this is the outside. Uh, before we closed it fully, we tried to open as much as possible for members of the public. We organized some events so that actually you can, you can have more and more people come and appreciate what it used to be like because no trains run through it anymore. Um, so these are some of the things that we hope, you know, uh, whether it's for the old or the young, that we'll be able to perhaps also relive some of the history that, that they may be familiar with. Um, but to, to some extent, um, there are challenges. Uh, first and foremost, of course, many of these properties are not built to be readapted. Um, if you look at, for example, uh, again, I come to, um, you know, the old turf club. It was not meant to be the F&B, the, the, you know, the youth that it is now. 
um, it does require some time and effort and resources to be able to reconfigure. And even if you reconfigure, you can't reconfigure the whole place uh, uh, into a particular use. Uh, so these are some of the challenges uh, that, that we do face. The other one is the not in my backyard uh, um, you know, uh, mentality sometimes. Uh, so for example, increasingly, we also find that as Singapore matures, as we have uh, a more elderly population, that some sites perhaps could be used for some of these elderly care facilities. But we have also faced uh, uh, feedback, we have also had feedback that um, sometimes many people say, no, 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 I don't want you know, these in, in my community for various reasons. Um, how do we square off the balance? How do we you know, strike the, the uh, uh, dynamics and the tension between, between these? So these are sometimes the challenges that you face when you, when you look at trying to reconfigure some of uh, these properties. The last one is really the geospatial and geodetic development in Singapore. And this is a relatively new development. Um, over the last 200 years, because of the property information and because of the land titles information that we have uh, kept, we have developed a full body of information or land information in Singapore, which is now critical if you talk about development of the country going forward. Because if you do not know what is as is now, it is very difficult to plan properly what is going forward. Um, together with the advance of technology, instead of having things in 2D, two-dimensional form, you are now able to have it in three-dimensional, right? Uh, um, simply by modeling, simply by capturing the images and, and redoing. Virtually, I think today, the young, nobody talks about 2D anymore. Everybody is 3D or even live uh, information. So you will find that for planning purposes and for a host uh, of other purposes, there is a need, there's a growing need for three-dimensional information. And this is something that the Singapore Land Authority is actively collating and capturing. Um, you, of course, may say, well, we have Google Maps, uh, or we have, I don't know, Waze, or some other platforms, which is true. Um, but our responsibility is to make sure that the information that we capture is accurate and up-to-date. Um, I think you may have heard of some stories about you know, uh, um, properties being wrongly identified in Google Maps and therefore you know, being wrongly demolished and so on. Imagine if that were to happen in Singapore. Imagine if a public agency were to use Google Maps and say, well, I'm going to acquire this land, but actually it turns out to be another plot that, that you should be acquiring. I think the repercussions are going to be very serious. So our responsibility is to be able to collect proper, accurate information, which of course, as far as possible, we will share with of the public. Um, there are other reasons for collecting 3D information, as you can see from here. Um, things like, in fact, things like airflow management, flood simulation, uh, urban heat studies, solar potential studies, and so on. I think some of this, uh, even CLC has done some studies around it. In order to be able to have proper, uh, um, I suppose, studies being done, the most fundamental is that you must have accurate land data and accurate building data. Uh, um, to do so. So what we have done, embarked over the last couple of years is that we have started to collect comprehensively 3D data in Singapore. First, by using airborne laser scanning, by flying a plane around Singapore. Thereafter, by, by using a, a car which is not you know, dissimilar to, to the one that Google uses to collect you know, uh, underground data. Now, obviously, when you use uh, um, a plane to capture images, there will be certain blind spots. And, I, and really, the cast is to supplement the blind spots and to confirm certain areas. So you take it from the top as well as take it from the, the bottom. And once we collect all the information, we will then model it such that it becomes a 3D uh, platform, uh, which we will use, uh, share with other agencies uh, uh, for their planning purposes. Um, so this is, how, this is what something we have looked like. Okay, um, and um, obviously the resolution uh, as technology improves uh, will be improved. Um, our challenge today and later I will share is how to make sure that we continue to keep this data set current. Uh, because as you know, Singapore redevelops at an increasingly uh, uh, fast pace. Today you take a picture, tomorrow something else may have happened. So what, what are the ways that we can do to, to, to keep uh, this current? Um, the second one, which is quite interesting, is the fact that now we are starting or embarking on our effort to collect underground data. 
Um, I mentioned uh, this morning to a group that I was uh, discussing with that um, in Europe and in many uh, Western countries, um, underground infrastructure is much more advanced than us because typically uh, people go underground to escape the cold. Um, and I think many of the uh, Scandinavian countries, uh, uh, that is the way to keep warm during winter, during the cold, harsh winters. Um, so we are now starting to uh, trying to figure out what is the best way um, to collect underground data. Not necessarily deep underground, but even surface underground. For example, even simple things like utility lines, uh, gas lines, uh, sewage pipes, and, and so on. Um, you may, uh, I think all of us would have encountered, you know, uh, some sometimes workers, you know, uh, digging up the roads and, and you know, putting back pipes and, and so on. How do we accurately capture that data so that going forward, we are able to plan in a very clean manner as well as to be able to have this accurate data. Um, it is not sim so simple because uh, for the surveyors uh, in us, one of the, I think one of the things that they used to learn in school is you cannot survey what you cannot see. And really, underground is something that unless you open up, you will not know what is, is, is there. Um, there are evolving technologies, there's evolving science to be able to use either electromagnetic waves or solar or radar, um, but it is still not fully accurate or it is still not as good as opening up you know, uh, uh, to see what it is. So this is the challenge uh, that we have. But because Singapore is land scarce, uh, we do feel that there is a need to go down deeper to see what more potential that we can have for underground use so that we are able to maximize the land that we have. Um, so with that, I thought I'll stop. Um, I hope that gives you a flavour of, of some of the things that the Singapore Land Authority does. Uh, obviously, there are more details in, in the book that's launched, and um, I will be happy to, to answer any questions that, that, that may arise. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Tan. Yeah, may I invite you to remain on stage uh, while we set the stage for the Q&A session. As we have heard from Mr Tan, I think um, it's really very challenging for SLA on one hand, being the bad guy <laughs> to acquire land, to ensure that we have enough land for the future, but at the same time also being the good guy, pumping out information and uh, ensuring a zero vacancy rate for our state properties, and at the same time also putting out land for public spaces. So uh, may I now also invite Mr Choi, uh, the moderator uh, for today's session, and he's actually the former senior advisor of the uh, Urban Redevelopment Authority and also a member of uh, CLC's panel of experts. So Mr Choi will actually first start off uh, the dialogue before opening up to the floor. Uh, during the Q&A, please state your name and organisation uh, before posing your questions or comments. So over to you, Mr Choi. Hello. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as Mayor has introduced me, I'm now the <coughs> on a panel of experts with the Centre for Livable City. But I spent 27 years of my career with Urban Redevelopment Authority in uh, selling land and uh, property market policy. So I worked a lot, very closely with SLA over the last 27 years. Bunkai, that was a really excellent presentation. Thank you. And I must say that in my almost 30 years of working with land matters, I've not had the opportunity to witness such an interesting, comprehensive, and informative uh, presentation. Uh, well, my job here is to warm up the Q&A so that you can ask your questions. So maybe I, should, I can start Please. with one question. Uh, Wunka, you have talked about SLA being the custodian, acting as a custodian for state land. And we have agencies like URA and HDB who are agents selling state land uh, most, most noticeably under the government land sales or GLS program. Uh, for us in government, such distinction of role is very important that you are the custodian and we are the agent. And we really want to separate, keep such roles separate. But there was a time, I remember some years back, when the SLA experimented with being an agent at the same time. Uh, it was a very interesting time, about three years, we attempted that. 
Uh, perhaps you can, uh, and, and it's, it's conceivable that one day SLA could become agent for land sales again. Maybe you can comment about, about this and explain this distinction and why it's so important to keep the role of the custodian and the agent separate. Um, I, I think one of the greatest strengths um, of, of the Singapore government structure today is the fact that um, you have checks and balances that ensure that whatever it is, uh, uh, systems, issues are not abused. So when it comes to land issues, it is particularly important that we keep this uh, check and balance. Um, to some extent, actually, um, it doesn't really matter who sells the land. What is important is that the sale of the land is properly accounted for, that the revenue that you get from the sale of the land is properly accounted for because that forms part of you know, uh, Singapore's resource. Um, in that sense, in that context, you know, there is then a distinction between who should sell the land and who should ultimately issue the lease. Um, not to say that between SLA and I suppose the other agencies that, that undertake the sale of the land, there is any quarrel or there's any agreement. No, on the contrary, um, in fact, the beauty of it is that um, each role or each agency has their specific function, but when all the agencies do their role, it comes together very seamlessly. Um, to an outsider, to a developer, for example, uh, quite honestly, um, I'm not sure that they actually uh, feel that there is a marked difference between one agency and another. It is almost like saying, well, you know, it starts with somebody else, but it ends with somebody else, but ultimately, it's still the Singapore government. Um, we hope that at least to keep this distinction, because back end, it allows not only for transparency, but for accountability. And, and I think this is a huge strength of any public service that wants to continue to retain the trust of, of its people. Uh, I'm not sure whether that, that un answers. Yeah. Can, can we hold the uh, questions a bit later? I have one or two more questions. <laughs> I, I don't think you're adequately warm up yet. <laughs> <laughs> I will do the warming up. And the next question is quite hot. Uh, Recently, there was this big news, and you mentioned it, about 200, almost 200 private properties on uh, terrace houses, in fact, they were terrace houses, in Geylang Lorong Tree, which will be returned to the state when their leases expire in uh, 2020. So it was quite sensational, the news. Uh, well, I would like you to give your version of the story, because it's as if you, know, you didn't treat the... Uh, the property owners well. But uh, a, a bigger, bigger question will be for properties on state land with leases running down, uh, the uncertainty of whether the leases will be extended can be quite disconcerting to the property owners. Uh, there's also concern that the properties will not be well maintained and will be run down. So can you tell us uh, whether and how SLA provides sufficient information on its lease extension policies and whether it can provide more certainty uh, about its lease extension policies to address such concerns. Maybe you talk about oh. how we have been more <laughs> than fair to the uh, property owners first. Okay, um, I, I, I suppose you know, I expected the question to come because uh, I think in the last couple of weeks there has been some um, reports in the media about um, the issue of, of declining leases and, and so on. So maybe let me start from the, the beginning or at least where we, we, we should uh, we start. Um, from a public policy perspective, um, the in order to allow Singapore to continue to redevelop and rejuvenate, um, and as Minister you know, Lawrence Wong had, had stated publicly, um, all the lands will return to the state when the lease expires. And um, I would like to at least share that that is necessary 
uh, because it is only through that that we can continue to relook, redevelop, rejuvenate Singapore as a country. Um, but we do recognise that um, that argument um, may not necessarily sink in quite easily with those who have a slightly different view of what they would like their property, which they consider their asset to do. Um, but nevertheless, I think you, know, um, you have to accept that when you buy a property, if it's on a declining lease, then you should take that into account. In the case of Lorong Tree Gelang, um, it is an estate where the leases will expire sometime in 2020. Um, there is a larger redevelopment plan for the entire Kalang area uh, for public housing. Um, if you go uh, to that site today, you will find that actually the pathways next to the river are very well done. Right? Um, the waterways are clean, it's beautiful. And really, it's in that context of redevelopment that the government feels that, well, there's an opportunity to take back the expiring leases when it finishes and to redevelop and intensify the area. Um, that will not only rejuvenate the entire site, but you will give, I suppose, more people better homes to live with it. Um, then, of course, then the question is, how do we do it? Really, actually, the question is not why we do it. Usually, the question is how do we do it that is contentious. And in that context, um, we have gone out, um, I suppose, uh, you know, with, in our view, sufficient notice, and to be able to try to assist relevant parties or appropriate parties to, to, you know, to either relocate or to, to resettle. So just to give you a context, uh, when we looked at the site, there are 191 uh, terrace houses. Um, the majority had been let out um, by owners um, as foreign workers' dormitory. Right? So the place as it is uh, today is quite crowded. The infrastructure is not keeping up you know, with, with the crowd and, and so on. Um, there are, of course, some residents, I think about 30 over, um, who are still staying there. Um, and we accept some of them elderly, and we thought that it was important for us to be able to reach out to them to not only explain to them the rationale for taking back the property after lease expires, but more importantly, uh, to be able to communicate with them, because many of them actually uh, don't necessarily speak English. Uh, and we have, when we have young officers, our young officers must be equipped to be able to communicate with them and to be able to provide whatever necessary assistance within our means to help them through the journey. Which is why I mentioned walking the, journey, uh, walking the stakeholder journey is important. Um, to some extent, I think some of them have been uh, are very receptive. They actually understand the rationale uh, uh, of why the government is doing this. But perhaps because they are elderly, they now find that they need more assistance or they feel lost you know, trying to work through wow, what are the different you know, rules or what are the different applications that you have to, to fulfill in order to you know, relocate. And I think this is, journey is, is uh, um, important. Um, we hope that once you know, we are able to take back the leases, uh, then naturally it gives you know, the development agencies, whether it's URA, whether it's HDB, the real opportunity to reconfigure the site. And I think um, the last 50 years has shown that um, hopefully when the Singapore government says that it will do it, it will happen. Um, it's probably only a matter of time um, because we also have to look at phasing out the developments. But certainly from, I think, the plans that the URA has, has shown when we uh, did the media announcement, it looks like a very exciting plan. So I hope that, that you know, assures that people that actually, you know, uh, um, we don't just take back you know, properties or let properties decline for no reason. There is usually a larger goal behind that. Um, I think on your second part about whether we can give more clarity uh, um, on, on expiring leases, I think the answer is certainly as far as possible, yes. Um, uh, but to some extent, we also 
you know, have to work with the different agencies. Um, many plans can change. I mean, to be fair, you know, we could extrapolate what Singapore would be like in 100 years. Uh, but you may not, you know, somewhere along the line in, in 20, 30 years time, you know, the, the, you know, the times may change. I mean, uh, transport infrastructure is a classic case. I think when we built the MRTs with hindsight, we should have said, you should have built longer, we should have built larger, we should have built more extensive. Um, you know, um, the reality is, is that obviously there are certain, still certain factors that you cannot uh, foresee clearly. Um, what we therefore uh, uh, try to do is we try to give clarity as far as possible, but at times when we are not able to, we will tell you, well, I'm, I'm sorry at this stage, we are not able to, but we do tell you that we will give you sufficient time for you to, to plan. Um, and hopefully that gives some sort of assurance, even if it's not. I mean, to, to some extent, and, and I will perhaps, you know, uh, again, you know, if, if you don't quote me, we do have inquiries coming, you know, where the estates are like, you know, 80, 70 years still remaining. You know, and, and you know 80, 70 years is still a very long time. It would, you know, uh, unless you have a crystal ball that you can really foresee in the future, you know, it would be quite difficult to be able to tell what happens. Uh, but certainly, if it's you know coming up to to a much closer date, uh, we will endeavour our best uh, to be able to give you that clarity or give give uh, uh, the public the clarity. Thank you, Bunkai. I have a long list of questions, but I yeah. think I should not be unfair. Uh, we open uh, to the floor for questions. I can see a lot of very excited, anxious people. <laughs> Please, Pam. Um, I am Pamelia Lee, and in my last work life, I was a collector of land revenue, and I sold land for government. Um, the sites that I sold were Alcoff Mansion for themed events, Talok Ai Market, Laguna Golf Club, which I included a hotel component thanks to URA, a resort hotel component, a Dragon Kiln, which I used to save and Tangling Mall, which you recall, used to be the cultural theater, handicraft center, and it was given to me to run. And I said, I don't think I can make it succeed. So I amalgamated the whole site, and I sold it um, as a hotel come shopping center. And that was the easiest parcel to sell. But now that I've retired, I drive around, and I see empty black and whites, and I see people who run seaside attractions always nervous about how long their lease will be. And I know that land office has to maintain all this too. They have to maintain all the empty black and white houses. They have to maintain all the beach sites that we reclaim on the southern islands, and we thank you for that. But I'm wondering if we could be more imaginative with government, private sector, tourism board, if, I, if they would get interested, that we could bring new uses. Because I know a young couple that wanted to get married in a black and white house. And they went door to door leaving notes to say, can I borrow your house? And they went to land office, but they found out it was too complicated to borrow the house for a month or for two weeks or whatever. But I thought if such things could happen, it would enrich our life and maybe cut down the main maintenance for land office. Thank you. Um. Well, uh, Pam, you, you will be delighted to know that um, we had our first wedding held at a black and white. Uh, about two weeks ago, I think. Two weeks ago. It's on our Facebook page. Uh, so um, so uh, what, 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 actually how it came about really is, is that um, a young couple uh, drove by, I think uh, drove by a black and white, which was vacant. Uh, they made an inquiry and we said yes. Um, and, and I take your point. I, I think that there is certainly a lot more scope to be a bit more imaginative um, in, in using black and whites. Um, my philosophy to black and whites is very simple. Um, I think that um, if you have real estate blood in you, these are the treasures of Singapore. Um, if you look at many other countries with black and whites, unfortunately, they are not so well maintained. Uh, we thanks to you know, uh, many of uh, my predecessors who have taken the step to deliberately 
maintain them and together with URA, some of them are conserved. Um, I think, you know, from the government's perspective, the government has also invested a lot in trying to upkeep uh, uh, the properties. Um, but you will also notice that many of the black and whites today uh, reside in residential areas. Um, to a large extent, um, without even talking about the disamenities that it may cause, um, a lot of the black and white houses or bungalows today are not configured for mass use. So, so let me give you an example. Um, we may think that, wow, a huge black and white bungalow, you know, in the old colonial days, all houses were huge. Or in the old days, all houses were, were huge. Um, you know, when you look at a black and white bungalow, you know, like for example, 20,000 square feet, you would think, wow, you know, um, the reality, of course, as we all know today, is that um, very few people would, would pay, you know, huge amounts to stay in, in, in this. Um, so why not for others? Uh, certainly, some of the challenge is that the infrastructure today can't cope. Um, for example, if we were to convert uh, a typical black and white bungalow to, let's say, just a uh, a uh, uh, F&B use, you know, um, the, the amount of, of infrastructure in terms of utilities, sewage and all this would have to increase. And this needs, you know, uh, more than just, you know, a stroke of the pen to say, you know, I can change. Uh, there will be disabilities caused. And I think we are extremely conscious of the fact that the last thing we want to do is to change the nature and the character of the entire estate. So where we can, we do do so. Um, there are black and whites who are reconfigured, for example, to offices. There are also black and whites that are reconfigured, perhaps around the fringe of certain estates, to childcare users. Because with the amount of vast land, it's perfect for the little children to run around and, and so on. Um, so we have to that, at least strike that balance. We work very closely with, with URA in that respect. Um, and I think, to be fair, URA has been quite open to how we can, not only URA, URA, LTA, you know, even the other you know, public agencies like SEDF, how we can configure some of these properties for other users other than residential. So I, I hope that you know, I can give you that assurance. Um, some of my, my team members are here. Uh, believe me, every day I'm you know, asking them, so what next? Because you, the last thing you want is, well, everything's still just for you know, one use, residential. Um, so hopefully in, in time to come, we will see more and more without necessarily changing the entire character of the estate and without causing undue inconvenience to the surrounding neighbours. Okay, next question. Can I remind you to state your name and the organisation that you're from? Hi, uh, my name is Lim Sun Heng. And I'm the president of the Society of Floating Solutions, Singapore. Uh, you know, our port activities is now moving west to us. Uh, Anjong Paga, Keppel, and the Pirani, they're all moving westward. That leaves us with a huge opportunity to, de to develop the sea space around those areas. Yeah. Right. And uh, if you look around in other parts of the world, Netherlands is a good example. They are now experimenting with developing a city that is three square kilometers on floating islands, right? Maldives is building floating golf courses, right? Korea is uh, building floating theaters, right? Dubai has got floating mansions. All right. So we, we, we are so short of land, we should also exploit that uh, potential. I come from a shipyard. I worked for Capo for many, many years. And I know it can be done. Right? After all, we built uh, structures that are 500 room floating, uh, floating hotels for operation in the North Seas, where the environment is extremely harsh. I had the opportunity uh, just last Friday to meet up with URA, HDB, and STP to ex explore this area. And the question arises from one of the uh, parties that we talked to. If I put a floating structure in the sea, does that come under SLA or MPA? 
and nobody seems to know the answer to that. <laughs> so please. Uh, I, I think the, the, the answer to your question is, it will definitely come under somebody. <laughs> um, in terms of reclaimed land, it comes under SLA. Uh, um, in terms of foreshoring, it comes under SLA. But I think what you, you have mentioned is, is obviously something that um, we have not quite determined. Um, to some extent, um, the difference between land and, I suppose, sea, I mean, you can see sea, but, but it could be non-land, for example, is the ability to be able to mark out your boundaries. So if, if today on land it's very clear, you know, you are able to determine exactly where your boundaries are and you are able to determine from that boundary, therefore, what your rights and obligations are. Um, I am told that in C, it's a little bit different because obviously it moves and, well, I suppose conditions may, may change as well. Um, so I, I don't have an answer to your question. Um, I think instinctively, um, I might hazard a guess that it might depend on what you put on it. Um, uh, but, but that is really, you know, something that, that has, has just come. But, but I, I think, obviously, on land, it's very clear. I, um, if today, you, instead of, of the sea, you, you were to say, how about if it floats into the air, semi-permanently, right? Um, I would have no answer for you as, as well. But, but I would like to think that if you can consider it as part of Singapore's territory, not territorial waters, but territory, then perhaps uh, SLA might, might raise their hand and say, I think we should consider that as land. Next question, John. It's a little tea storm in a teacup. Huh? That's really nothing. My sense are on the ground, there's a bigger storm brewing that SLA should pay attention to. And by that, I mean the 99 lease of the HDB household. Now, land acquisition was easier in those days. Because why? You're playing with small numbers, high value. Huh? So only a few people complain. Huh? With the, 99 year lease, you got about 85%, maybe more, of your population who will be knocking on your door, right? Uh, it's not there yet, but you will be knocking on your door in 20 years' time. And the compound problem to the 99 year is the SERS, because SERS by nature is selected. And the problem with SERS is that every time the government goes down to do a SERS of, say, six blocks, the people of the six blocks are happy because, well, extra income coming in, eh? capital value, right? They may top a little bit, but the value goes up. And each one get off with an X dollar income, 100,000, 200,000 easy eh, per pop. The problem is that the 1,000 people are happy. You got about 6,000 people around there who are completely unhappy. And a recent uh, advance notice from the ministry is that it's a service by nature is service. It's not going to happen to all the world, which is correct. The question how are you going to manage that emotional problem? Technically, I know what you're doing. You can do it, you can do the numbers, you can do all your uh, assessment and say, do it here, do it there, and you do your redevelopment. But the question is now you're dealing with, un, uh, you know, 85% of the population knocking on your door with unhappiness, uh, not so much technical problem, but emotional uh, annoyance. Thank you. Um, yes, well, I... I I think you are right. Um, this, is, this is obviously a very complex issue. Um, this is an issue that potentially affects many parties. Um, but like I've said earlier before, um, really the, the, at least the, the guiding uh, philosophy today is that um, when leases expire, you know, 
it should be returned to the state. But as you rightly pointed out, it, it's not an economics, it is not an infrastructure issue, it is an emotional issue. Um, and, and for various reasons, I mean, you, we can go deep into you know, uh, all the details. Um, but, but fundamentally, I suppose, you know, the question is, do, you, do people accept that when their leases expire, the land should be returned back in order for you know, uh, uh, better things to, to be done? Um, I, I don't think there's a perfect solution, honestly. And, and I think, uh, you know, MND and, and I think Kun Hien recently has also said, you know, um, what we are able to, to at least say now is that when you choose on your own free will to buy, you know, a property, um, you know, which you know is a, is, has a declining value, then you need to go in with your eyes open. Uh, because at the end of the day, it's, it's a personal choice. Um, I, I mean, this is, I think, the, the, all we can say. Uh, because I, I don't think, uh, you know, at, at this stage, there is a perfect, you know, uh, solution. Um, we, we, to some extent, and, and I know you, you said, you know, the Lorong Tree Gelang is, is, you know, just a snippet. Um, but certainly, I think we've, we found that uh, people understand, and then that's very important. You know, because when people understand, their expectations also follow accordingly. They may be very emotional first, uh, because of, of the issue that stares at them. Uh, but I, w I would like to, you know, think that actually, rationally, People actually know, and they go in with their eyes open. The, uh, <coughs> the lady over there, yeah? Hi, uh, my name is MK. I'm here in my personal capacity. Um, interesting to hear all the comments, but um, with due respect to Mr. Chan, I think it, as what uh, Dr. Uh, Chong also stated in a recent public seminar, if you buy 99 years, then you know, right, as what uh, Mr. Tan also said. So emotion aside, there is the legal sanctity of contract, that if you buy 99 years, you would be getting 99 years and full stop. But correlated to that, what I cannot understand is from the presentation slides that uh, Mr. Tan put up just now, there is another aspect of private non-landed properties, which have been sold from previous GLS or whatever, that are 99 years. And yet, typically now, owners, even of freehold condos, are facing that through the on block law. They're effectively getting anything from 10 to 20 to 35 years of lease. How does that square up with legal sanctity, rule of law, all these things that should matter to Singapore? Your comment, please. If, if I can paraphrase, I, I think you're, you're saying why, you know, why do we have, I suppose, a regime that allows you know, a majority of owners uh, to be able to agree to an en bloc, um, even though the, the tenure has not, has not uh, um, reached its, its end. Um, <sighs> we... There are, there are some issues that obviously um, I, I'm figuring out how, how perhaps to, to, to put it. There are, there are areas that, that obviously you cannot always expect the government to step in. Um, in many of the en bloc developments, it is really an issue of the owners collectively uh, you know, to deal with potential uh, buyer. Um, I think that it is a never-ending, but this is my personal opinion, I think that it is a never-ending argument of whether you should say, I must get unanimous approval, or at what stage do I allow 80%, 90%, and, and so on. Um, of course, that is not really the, the end story. The, the, the end story subsequently is that from a planning and from a development perspective, the public agencies must allow the redevelopment to take place. If it doesn't happen, then, well, you know, uh, um, I suppose too bad. The developer has made a wrong choice, uh, uh, taken the wrong bet, uh, uh, and the place will not, you know, be rejuvenated. 
um, fundamentally, there are two ways redevelopment can take place. One is the government takes an active role. One is that the private sector takes a role. Um, I think that it would be inconceivable to say that today all development is undertaken by the public sector, the government undertakes. Uh, you do need to leave uh, areas where the private sector, the private developers can come in um, to perhaps produce something that is better that the government uh, has not done. So for example, um, I mean it, it is not the best example, but government's primary obligation is to produce or at least to build um, houses or, or flats which are more affordable to the general public. Uh, we don't build flats, you know, which we sell at $2,300 uh, uh, per square foot. You know, that is left to, to the market to decide. Um, and in that sense, again, if you look at the sanctity of, of contract, it is really a willing seller, willing buyer transaction. Um, I mean, I, I, you shake your head because if you are the minority, then obviously you... you Majoritarianism came about through uh, SLA initiative of the LTSA, the Land Title Strata Act. It did not come about through market forces. So I can recognize that you do need uh, land intensification, you do need urban renewal. Um, whether you should do it in a managed way with regulatory oversight, or you just say, well, to the dogs and to the market. Um. The real estate sector today, as, as you probably will agree with me, is already a highly regulated sector. Uh, um, there is not as much room or freedom uh, to maneuver. I mean, if you look at many other countries, uh, um, you know, even our neighboring countries, you will know that you know, sometimes the developers can manipulate the rules to, to suit this. Um, and, I, and I think we have largely, I won't say we, we you know, I, I, I except that there are room for improvements. Um, uh, but I would probably say that, you know, to have more regulation in an extremely regulated environment is not always the wise, wise choice. Um, certainly, I, I take your point. Um, I, I, to be fair, I, I don't have my colleagues from, from URA here uh, who are actively also looking at all these issues constantly. Uh, but, I mean, if you will allow me, if this is this is something that seriously needs to be considered, then I will be happy to, to take this back internally and, and discuss with them. Uh, <clears throat> in the interest of time, I think maybe we can have maybe two more questions. On already? Okay, it's a very short question. Um, following what Ms. Pamela Lee said about your black and white houses, I know there's some single story ones. Um, would you be willing to rent or lease or sell 99 year lease for living facilities for the elder care? Because uh, today we're seeing an aging population and not all nursing home, but they do need to be to live together and be supervised. And some of your units are really ideal, <laughs> but, but it's a lot of money to invest, to conserve and to make it uh, elder friendly. And so we do need a bit of time on the lease, if you accept. And don't forget, old people are also residential. I know that some uh, people think that, oh, my property tax people, for example, say, you're running an elder care, so now it's commercial property tax. It's really not, but I don't mind because commercial is cheaper. So, um, truly, will you lease? Long, uh, medium long term for elder care, for assisted living facilities, not nursing homes. Nursing home is a, a different story. Second question is a follow up of your very good uh, talk on uh, renewal of leases. What happens if a 99 year lease uh, in conservation houses with on both sides a free home and it's a standalone residential? There's a few, uh, believe me, I know. Like in Little India, say three shop houses or one shop house is 99 years, left 60, and the others are free home. 
there's no reason to acquire it because you can't redevelop it. Will the existing owner be allowed to renew the lease? There are a few. Um, I did one in mm. Teloai Street where it was down to 60 years and I bought for 99 years when I redeveloped. I mean, restored it, not redeveloped. So there's no good reason for the government to take back because the rest are free home. They can't do anything about it, which the owner hasn't already done. Thank you. Um, I, I suppose the short answer is that if the owner, owner, whoever the owner is, uh, would like to ask for a lease top up, please let us know. Right? Uh, um, uh, we, we see uh, or we assess all the lease top ups on a case by case basis. Um, certainly taking into account the surroundings, certainly taking into account the planning intent and, and so on. Um, and I take your point. Um, we don't, for example, say just because, well, you know, there's no reason uh, to extend or, to, re or to, to let it lapse, therefore we will not. We do consider a whole host of, of, of factors. We do consult all the different agencies um, to see what is the longer planning intent. Um, and there are, as you, as you know, uh, instances where leases are renewed. Um, so please, if, you, you know, if, if the owner feels that um, you know, uh, there's nothing to stop the owner from, from applying to us, um, sometimes we will tell the owner, well, the planning intent is still a little bit longer. Can you perhaps come back you know, uh, um, a couple of years later? Well, it, it really depends. How many more years? Sorry? Well, I, I suppose, you know, uh, um, certainly I would like to think that 20, 30 years we would have much clarity, right? Uh, um, I, I don't know because I, I don't know the specific property that you're talking about. Um, yeah, if it's 20 years, well, certainly I, I think, you know, uh, it will warrant, you know, a, a full consideration. We will work with the different agencies. Uh, including URA to say, well, I think you know maybe the time is right to really decide one way or other. Okay, um, on on your other question about elderly care facilities, well, as you know, of course, the Singapore government is very very concerned about this because of the aging population, and it is true that that um, you know they are also looking at at this issue in more broader terms, not necessarily nursing homes, but the whole spectrum. Um, for Many of these black and white that, that you mentioned, they are obviously available for lease. They are not available for sale. Um, when our lease typically is what you will lease out in the market. Uh, um, you know, for example, two years, two plus two, and, and so on. Um, largely because we don't take the position of selling the black and whites. Now, sorry? Well, you know, there is nothing, we don't, I, I don't think at this moment, um, we actively chase out, you know, residents who stay. To invest, to renovate, I need sufficient time. Well, it is no different, I, I suppose, if today you were to go into any private development and you were to lease. I mean, the private developer would be unlikely to tell you, I will give you 30 years. No, I mean, we have done for 10 years, 6 years, 6 years, long leases, because a lot of money understand. If you think that, you know, there are uh, such areas that you look at, well, please feel free to, to approach us. I think we can, it warrants us taking a further look. Uh, we may come back to you with, with a slightly different proposal, but uh, um, I'm open to at least taking a look at what proposal you have. Can I have the last question? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Raymond, Raymond Kwok. I'm from uh, Independent Director of HSBC Insurance. It's my new role. Um, I got one question and one observation uh, with your comment. The first one is, uh, I love the picture behind you. What I'm asking is that, how can, how, what, what are the possibilities of us developing further up to the sky? Because we have people talking about using the sea, etc. Because it's very important for us as a small island, uh, I think you know, we may be leaving our space, although we still got a lot of space left. When I drive around, there's still a lot of space. Second question is that, uh, I think the question asks, uh, is the C belongs to SLA, my thinking out loud is that most likely some authority should control all the things. Instead of saying land, maybe uh, Singapore Land Authority, we change it to Singapore Territory. So you take care of the land, the sea, and the space. 
and then that, that might be easier. You know, somebody has to make a decision, right? We cannot be passing the bucks to everybody. Anyway, that's just a second observation. Maybe the first one. Let's well, contested question and the session. Um, I, I would, I would probably say, you know, your first question is probably answered by the planners. You know, how high we can we can build. Um, but if you ask me, really, uh, uh, certainly. Um, safety and security aside, uh, it is really up to what technology allows us to do so. Um, um, I think in today, if you, if you know some of our buildings have gone beyond 300 meters in height in the central area, uh, yes, you, if you look at some other countries, everybody is rushing to build the tallest. Um, you know, if, if from a planning perspective, it, it warrants us to go that way, I'm sure you know, there is only a matter of time. Uh, but like you said, you know, maybe we don't need to go there in the near future yet because we still have other, other you know, areas of land. Um, I, I should mention, and I did, did mention this uh, enough, you know, at the end of the day, together with all the other public agencies, URA, NPARCs, uh, HDB, and so on, really the fundamental that we are trying to build is we are trying to build a livable city. Um, and, and as Ting Chai would, would, you know, be able to tell you, it is really, you know, uh, um, you know having enough space, you know, not just buildings, having enough greenery, having enough, you know, uh, walkways to make it almost like living in a garden, right? Um, and I think one of the things certainly about exploring underground is, is not so much of living underground, but freeing up land above ground where you can put some of, you know, this, this infrastructure and so on uh, underground. Um, it's a, it's a long-term project, uh, you know, but I think that if we get it right uh, with data, with information, with planning, uh, with judicious land use, I'm sure that you know, going forward, next 50, 100, even 150 years, Singapore will be a much better place. All right, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of the uh, <coughs> talk and the Q&A session. I think there is going to be a book presentation uh, ceremony. Yes, okay, you thank you, gentlemen. Uh, yes, may I uh, invite you all to remain on stage and uh, may I now also invite uh, CLC's Executive Director, Mr. Ku Teng Chai. Yeah. <laughs> Before that, yes, thank the gentlemen for the very lively well, discussion. <laughs> yep, so thank you. And may I invite uh, CLC's Executive Director, Mr. Ku Teng Chai, to come on stage to present the Urban System Study, Land Framework of Singapore, Building a Sound Land Administration and Management System. Well, so we would like to present this as a token of appreciation to Mr. Tambunkai and Mr. Choi Champong. May I ask the gentleman to remain on stage? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we are very honoured to have the partnership of SLA and Ministry of Law in documenting this publication. Thank you, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you may um, wish to urgent okay, to take a seat. I'm also very grateful to see some of the contributors today um, at this book launch and uh, all of you are actually welcome to pick up a copy for free um, at the uh, reception later. Okay. So thank you for being a part of uh, today's event. We hope that you have enjoyed today's lecture. Our next CLC lecture is on uh, Shanghai, Lessons in Urban Regeneration and Conservation. It will happen tomorrow at 10 a.m. at the URA Function Hall. Right. So Shanghai, some called it the Pearl of the Orient, has transformed into a livable city where past and present thrive. So hope you can find out more from Wang Ling of uh, Shanghai Jiao Tong University tomorrow. Thank you very much for attending the lecture. So we'll see you again. Thank you.